Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really awesome guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow for many people out there. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined uh, by Dr. Phyllis Farrell, who is a Chief Impact Officer for Startup Health's Alzheimer's Moonshot which is this new global initiative created to develop a, a really collaborative, innovative community uh, with, involving leading companies, research teams, various stakeholders, ultimately with a mission to accelerate the progress in prevention, diagnosis, and management of Alzheimer's disease uh, and related dementia, uh, and with the support from uh, the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, as well as Gates Ventures. Uh, they're looking to really break down silos and foster meaningful collaboration between various mission-aligned founders, funders, and and partners. Uh, Dr. Farrell is also a strategic advisor uh, at the uh, Davos uh, Alzheimer's Collaborative. Uh, there, they're involved in building a really interesting global clinical trial network and technology platform. Um, prior to these roles, uh, she served almost three decades in, in multiple roles at Eli Lilly, uh, including uh, as global head of external engagement for Alzheimer's and neurodegeneration, uh, as chief commercial services officer, and as vice president of uh, global Alzheimer's disease platform platform team leader in Lilly Biomedicines. And there she was responsible for a variety of late stage development and global registration uh, and launch programs involving late stage assets that's like uh, Solazinezumab, uh, Amavid, uh, AZD-3293, among others. Uh, Dr. Farrell received her um, uh, doctorate in public health, Indiana University, uh, MBA, from Stanford, Bachelor's of Arts in Economics and Management from DePaul University, and uh, needless to say, has, has a long list of awards and other responsibilities that we will put in the bio of the show, uh, so we don't waste uh, 15 minutes going into all these, but we're honored to have her. A lot of really interesting uh, topics to get into today. Uh, Dr. Phyllis Farrell, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Oh, I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's it's great having you. Uh, you know, it typically, uh, I don't have a lot of folks coming on that have your background in the sense of uh, uh, commercialization as well as late stage development. Normally, we're talking about sort of the, the early stages of drug discovery and development. But you had this really interesting journey, as I mentioned, the bio, you're, you're doing a lot on the commercial front, you're managing these uh, amazing late stage assets. Um, and in the middle of all that, uh, your father is diagnosed with Alzheimer's, which adds another, you know, piece to this unique puzzle that you're involved in. Talk a little bit, those of you would about, about a little bit more about your background and, and this sort of interesting, uh, first part of your career, which, um, you know, a lot of challenges, but, uh, a lot of triumphs as well. Yeah, it is fairly unique. Um, I spent about the first half of my three decade career with Lilly on the commercial side of the business. Um, finance, marketing, sales, business development, strategy, uh, global and U.S., and really enjoyed all of that. It made a lot of sense with my background, a BA in economics, and as you mentioned, an MBA. But one of the things that happens in pharmaceutical companies is as products make it to the latest stage of development, they tend to put um, or can put a more general manager type in place in that latest stage. It really depends on what the molecule needs. And in the case of Alzheimer's disease, uh, I was asked to come over and lead the late stage development of our therapeutics and later our diagnostics. And the reason for that was because we had great scientists. We had fantastic science, but we had this really broken healthcare system. And so while you might make it over the regulatory hurdle, that doesn't make 
things change at the bedside. And so it was kind of like you might call in retail that last mile. And so there was a request for me to come over with a business background to help manage not just the the development and the regulatory milestone, but how do we make sure we're ready for launch? How do we make sure that the new innovation is actually going to get to the patient's who need it most. And uh, as you mentioned, about six months after I took that job, my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So not only was I learning through market research and uh, interviews and clinical trial experience, but I was learning from my own personal experience at the same time. And that's where I got super passionate about health system preparedness, because I saw what these companies were doing to get these new therapies through some really tough science and regulatory needs. And boy, what a shame if you actually are successful there and the patients who are going to benefit most can't actually get to the innovation. And it's it's really interesting because in uh, last year, around April, I think it is, you published these three papers sort of back to back, one uh, entitled Improving Community Healthcare Systems Early Detection of Cognitive Decline and Dementia, uh, then uh, towards a comprehensive value assessment for Alzheimer's disease innovations, and the last one, a framework for addressing Alzheimer's disease uh, without a frame, the work has no aim. Um, and in these three papers, it, it basically sums up in many ways what you were just talking about and the fact fact that, um, yeah, we, we have some awesome research going on, but unfortunately, in 2023 at the time, standard of care, although we might think it's an amyloid scavenging drug or this unique biomarker test over here, unfortunately, it still sort of boils down to this unpaid family caregiver. <laughs> I would love for you to talk a little bit about last year when you wrote these three papers and a little bit about what's contained in them, because I think it's extremely important or where we're going to be going with the moonshot later on. Yeah, and I think, you know, those papers were a culmination of a lot of experience. Um, and honestly, some of it was in clinical trials. You know, I remember joining the team and having someone say to me, Phyllis, Phyllis, we did it. The, the fastest ever clinical trial recruited. I was like, that's great. What happened? And, you know, the answer was it only took us 18 months to find a thousand people in the U.S. with Alzheimer's disease. And of course, I came from a commercial background and they were right. This was the fastest that had ever been done. And I'm scratching my head going, why did it take us 18 months to find a thousand people? And so the clinical trial recruiting problem was kind of the canary in the coal mine, right? We started pulling back those layers to say, what is going on? And what we found was this incredibly broken healthcare system where the mental model of someone with Alzheimer's disease is very, very late. And, you know, the, the therapies that were available at the time are used late. So that was, you know, made sense. But now we know through imaging that pathology starts 10 to 20 years before symptoms. So we had really been looking at Alzheimer's kind of like stage four cancer. Like that's where we were focusing. And, you know, if you really are going to modify the disease and slow the progression and hopefully at some point be able to even prevent symptoms, you've got to catch the disease much earlier. So really, we did a lot of research to say, what are all the things that are broken? Um, everyone wants this to be a silver bullet. If we just fix one thing, then, you know, it'll all work. And, you know, what we came to found, find was it really is not the case. It's death by a thousand paper cuts. You need to fix every single one of these problems. And that's where the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative got started mm -hmm. um, with the World Economic Forum, uh, which is the frame no aim. That's where we realized we were valuing um, care in the United States relative to what is already being spent by the health system. But if your standard of care is an unpaid caregiver, you need to look at value a lot differently. And then that's where we realized that you really had to transform the frontline care because you aren't going to find patients early if you go into neurology. You mm -hmm. can only find people early enough if you're actually thinking about your brain before things go wrong. Um, before it's a crisis. And that's where this idea of cognitive assessments and primary care. So it was, you know, it's kind of a, a culmination of a lot of work that started with how do we recruit these trials faster and rolled out to, oh, no, not only is this a clinical trial problem, but it's going to be a launch problem. You know, because we've been talking, um, you know, a lot uh, on the show lately about 
sort of moonshots in general, and we've profiled, you know, various uh, initiatives from over the years, obviously things like PEPFAR and, and HIV, which you know, it's been extremely successful. You know, you look at 40 years, $200 billion, and HIV has become, um, you know, it's no longer a death sentence, extremely manageable condition. Uh, we've been profiling, you know, some of the you know, things like ARPA-H, sort of a little moonshot factory there at, uh, at NIH. Um, clearly, Everybody wants their moonshots, but clearly with, you know, uh, you know, I think the curtain about $400 billion direct and indirect or sort of seen and unseen cost on, per Alzheimer's dementia, trillion dollars by 2050. I mean, this is, I mean, we, we all want our moonshots, but this is clearly a space combined with the fact that um, our pharmacotherapeutic armamentarium isn't awesome yet, um, requires a moonshot. And I, I would love if you could talk first, before we get into exactly what's happening for the Alzheimer's moonshot, talk a little bit about Startup Healthy, because it's really a, a moonshot factory uh, in many ways, and how you can basically focus on creating communities around these moonshots. Talk a little about the organization, if you would. Right. So I got connected with Startup Health boy, um, almost two years ago now, and was really intrigued by what they do. Uh, and the reason they talk about the moonshot is, and I didn't know this, um, maybe my husband did, he's a social studies teacher, but you know, when we put somebody in the moon in the United States, there were thousands of companies that were involved in doing that. And it wasn't this massive coordinated effort. They just all had this common goal and each had to play a role in getting there. So this concept of the moonshot that Startup Health has created is similar. And they've done this in several therapeutic areas, um, oncology, type 1 diabetes, others, and now launching Alzheimer's disease. And really the concept is you're going to need innovation across the entire ecosystem. So once again, this you know is similar to what I just mentioned that we had learned about where things were broken, right? So you need innovation in therapeutics, but you need innovation in diagnostics. You need innovation in early detection. You need innovation in care and support. You need innovation in social services. And so basically in launching the moonshot, um, there is a goal to support entrepreneurs. Um, being an entrepreneur, being a startup is a really hard thing to do, yeah. but this organization, they know how to do it. And it's a, you know, it's a translatable skill across therapeutic areas, everything from fundraising and contracting, go to market strategies, um, business development, um, how to work with a health system and also how to take care of yourself as an entrepreneur, you know, your own health and, and mental health. And so I really got attracted to what they were doing. And so when they approached me and said, we want to do this in Alzheimer's disease, you know, the concept is, yeah, let's do this. Let's make sure there's a community of innovators that are feeling supported through the Health Transformer University that Startup Health runs, but also they're part of a community of other entrepreneurs that feel like they're working together towards a wicked problem. And that's both for support, but it's also for sharing learnings, um, looking in opportunities for organic partnerships. And so it's it's a really exciting time, um, specifically for Alzheimer's disease. And we can talk a little bit about the specific Alzheimer's moonshot, but that's what Startup Health does. They support entrepreneurs through some of the places where um, the company might not make it. And we want as much many of those companies as possible uh, to make it so that that innovation can hit the ecosystem. Awesome. And, and you know, as I mentioned, you know, you, uh, you know, per, specifically per uh, the, the new Alzheimer's moonshot, um, you you have, you know, major partners obviously involved here. You mentioned uh, Gates Ventures, of obviously Microsoft Bill Gates, the uh, the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, which is related to the the Lauder family of Estee Lauder fame, which I think is one of the straight interesting, I, one of the only charities anywhere focused on, on Alzheimer's drug development. Uh, and you, you know, in addition to your roles um, now with Startup Health, you also you know have been a strategic reviewer for for I think the the Diagnostics Accelerator. You also sit on Gates Ventures uh, uh, Disease Data Initiative. Um, can you just say, I mean, again, a, a couple of words about what's involved sort of in putting together, I mean, obviously a little different than raising money for say a startup where, okay, here's my venture investors over here, a little different sell there, right? I mean, in, in how you sort of get together the folks that are interested in specifically doing this. Yeah, you really have to find the right fit funder. 
for mm -hmm. something like the Startup Health Moonshot. Uh, it's a it's a mission based investment. Um, and there's lots of different ways to make that investment. You can make it philanthropically. You can make it in a more of a, a fund type of way. But, you know, the really important reason that we went first to ADDF and Gates Ventures is they have played a leadership role in the field for a long time now. Before it was sexy to invest in Alzheimer's disease, they were going and trying to find where the gaps were that, that the the field needed, but they weren't being filled another way. And so the Diagnostics Accelerator is an example of that. You know, you had the Dem Dementia Discovery Fund, which is fantastic. It was launched um, as part of Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Cameron's Global Action Against Dementia. It's a therapeutic VC fund. Um, it is mission aligned. It's an impact fund, but it's a very traditional fund, right? There's a return to your investors. Diagnostics Accelerator needed to come in because there wasn't the same market driver for diagnostics as there was for therapeutics. So Diagnostics Accelerator was created by ADDF, funded by several high net worth individuals. You mentioned the Lauders. Um, there's also the Gates Group, Bezos, mm -hmm. Dolby. So several really great investors came in as a philanthropic VC, meaning it runs like a VC, but the investors aren't expecting a return any return evergreens the fund. So we approached them because they had already um, shown multiple examples. You mentioned the Alzheimer's disease data initiative that Gates Ventures started, right? That's a place for data democratization, data harmonization, data interoperability, so that our data that we have as a field works better together. And so they've already shown a real aptitude for coming in and filling in holes. And so the startup health leadership team was thrilled that they also came forward to be the first champions of the moonshot because they saw this need, not for just diagnostics accelerator companies, which of course will be included in the moonshot, but being able to invest in entrepreneurs across the whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So yeah, let's let's talk a little bit more about um, you know what's going to be happening. I know it's the inaugural year of the Moonshot. Uh, you know, I was reading that you're going to be selecting somewhere about around 20 different teams to to be part of this. You mentioned you know as, as part of they're going to be part of this uh, health transforming university, which I'd like you to go a little bit more into. And then I thought the you know sort of third piece of that, which is very interesting, is this um, uh, Moonshot scorecard. And and I thought. This is rather interesting in the sense that you know, you're just mentioning the Apollo project. Uh, yeah, clearly, if you're building the rocket ship and you, you, the boosters are fine, but you, you haven't perfected whatever the, the, the lunar lander, you're not going to get to the moon. Talk a little about what the, sc the scorecard's all about, because I think this is important in making sure that everyone's aligned on this thing. Right. So to start the moonshot, we're going to... In, um support 20 fellowships. So for 20 different companies or academic research teams, um, and there is a process for admissions. I will tell you, I'm not gonna stop at 20 um, because in just two months, we've had over a hundred companies apply for these fellowships. And it just goes to show you that we're at a place in an innovation curve in Alzheimer's disease that, um, that's just phenomenal. And so I can't say to 80 companies, we don't have a spot for you. So I'm going to go out on that fundraising trail and find a way to say, we need to support more of these companies, but we're going to start with 20. Um, and they will become part of a community that's the first community in the Health Transformer University. So they will, you know, they'll receive master classes, they'll receive one on one coaching, office hours, they'll work together as a community to both learn, grow, develop. Uh, the, there's actually two types of scorecards that Startup Health use, uses. One is a more general scorecard about the mindset of the founder. So this is something that says you need to have a founder that wants to come in and be part of a community. And because Startup Health has done this so many times across other disease states, they've got a really good feeling for what kind of founder is going to really benefit from this fellowship and is really going to give back to that whole moonshot, Alzheimer's moonshot community. So, so that's something that, that's really tried and true. What we're working on on the Alzheimer's um, scorecard is it's a, it's a selection process to say, how do we make sure we uh, manage across all of these different types of startups? You know, how do you make sure you have therapeutics and diagnostics and enabling technologies and care 
so, and support and, you know, maybe even something around prevention and brain healthy activities, right, for younger people. So those are all things that are really critical that'll be part of that scorecard. But also, you know, we do look at sustainability of the organization. We do want to make sure that, you know, obviously with, with only 20 uh, fellowships ready for 100 applicants, we want to make sure that you're placing the best bets. Um, we will measure the results based on um, what the companies say their own goals are. So basically, you're helping the company achieve their own goals. Some of those will be fundraising goals. You know, one of Startup Health's greatest assets is the relationship it has with the venture capital community. Mm -hmm. And so there's quite a bit of exposure that health transformers get for further partnerships and funding and fundraising. So that's part of it, but that's not all of it, right? It's also really looking at, is their product moving through its regulatory milestones? You know, mm -hmm. what are the other KPIs, uh, key performance indicators that they're setting for their own organization? And that will be part of the scorecard. I think the one other thing that's important, because um, you mentioned kind of both sides of my role here, is we are using that Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative Framework okay. to both categorize and measure results. Um, and so that's the other thing about startup health is they don't necessarily want to come in and create something from scratch. If there's something there, a framework to use, they're going to use it because it's really about pulling all the pieces together so that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And, and you know, thinking about uh, one part in, in particular, which is which I heard you talk about on a um, uh, another interview that you gave was. Um, focusing on women and, and not just the fact that this is a disease which not disproportionately affects women, but obviously an area where women are more likely to be the caregivers and so forth, which you were explaining. I had a very interesting discussion um, with um, with Dr. Elizabeth Garner a couple months ago, who's the CSO at Faring, but she's also the head of the American uh, Medical Women's Association. And it was really out, you know, I mean, it, it took me by surprise, sort of the amount, even in women's health, <laughs> that we don't know about women, um, let alone, you know, the female situation connected to all these diseases. And as you point out, dementia, I mean, this is a, a, a major unknown in this unmet medical need. Say a few words about this topic, if you, because I think it's an important piece. Obviously, not the only piece, but it's going to be an important piece when you're sort of looking at some of these technologies. How, you know, is there a specific uh, set of tools here that dives deeper into this reason why are women so disproportionately affected by this disease? Sure. Well, I, I mean, I just to to close the connection between the scorecard that you mentioned, uh, the scorecard is going to look at diversity and specifically health equity as well. So it's not going to just look at gender or underrepresented populations. It's also going to look at underserved populations because social determinants of health make a big difference in the risk of Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias. Uh, but specific to women, and I and I have a real passion for this, um, having been a women executive for 30 years, I speak to a lot of women's groups. And, you know, some degree, Alzheimer's disease has a disproportionate impact on women as patients because we live longer. And um, age is the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. However, if you even if you um, control for age, you do see differences in how this disease presents in women which by the way, isn't a big surprise. Women are not little men. And so, you know, this is something that it's taken a while for people to recognize. And in fact, I don't know if you saw that there was just a very large announcement made by Jill Biden and the Women's Health Access Matters yep. looking at women in research for just this reason. But we don't know all those differences yet. Um, you know, we do see that while women live longer, they have a different experience with the disease, which by the way, cardio, everyone remembers cardiovascular disease, right? And all the, um, all the education around heart attacks and how the symptoms of a heart attack look different in women than they do in men. Well, it's going to be the same thing in a lot of diseases, including Alzheimer's disease. So we need to understand those differences. We also need to recognize that women are four to one times more likely to be an unpaid caregiver. It's often the daughter, the niece, the granddaughter uh, that's stepping in to care. They also happen to be more likely to be the paid caregivers. So if anyone has dealt with a, a chronic care condition in their family and have had a CNA, 
uh, they're angels on earth, but they're also more likely to be women. So we talk about this being a, a woman's disease. And one of the reasons I get really passionate about this is this unpaid caregiver. There are women, because of the baby boomer, um, 65 year olds are turning, um, or baby boomers are turning 65 years old age at the rate of 10,000 a day in the mm. United States. And so those are all individuals who are going to have adult children. And as those individuals are starting to face this disease, adult women who are working full time are having to contemplate whether they leave the workforce. And they might do that not out of obligation, but they might do that with honor, but they still leave the workforce. And we've worked really hard to make gender differences in the workplace matter. So I get super passionate about making sure that we have support for unpaid caregivers, because in my own family, my sister left her job to help my mom care for my dad. Um, my mother's health declined because of the way she was caring for my dad. And that was in a family where we did have some paid caregiving in the home, maybe not as early or as much as we should have. But um, I'm super passionate about both understanding how these drugs and diagnostics work differently for women, but also making sure that we have all the other innovation around caregiving, caregiving support, how do we use technology to make sure that people can live in their homes longer? And how do we make sure that we're supporting family caregivers? Oh, one thing I'll add um, for those women that might be listening or even men, uh, there are brain healthy behaviors that we should all be doing right now. And, uh, you know, those include diet, uh, Mediterranean diet and exercise, mm -hmm. you know, uh, quitting smoking, managing your blood pressure very tightly, drinking only in moderation, cognitive exercise, social engagement. And the big one is sleep. We need to be getting quality sleep seven to eight hours every night. And so I often talk to women's groups and say, leave the dirty dishes in the sink and go to bed. Um, because when you talk to a 45 year old woman who's raising children, caring for their parents uh, in a double income working situation and you tell her to sleep seven to eight hours a night, she laughs at you. Right. But that's probably one of the most important things we can be doing for our brains. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And, and, it, and it gets me thinking a, a bit about um, sort of the next topic, um, which is sort of, uh, I, I call it, I'll, I'll say age tech, you know, uh, sort of the general term, because I, I noticed that uh, last couple of years, you've been at a lot of these conferences uh, on sort of, you know, sort of the silver economy and talking about sort of this intersection between aging, digital health, early detection. Uh, there was this, this cool one, uh, aging in a digital world, driving early detection across aging societies. Um, the, this is a, an area that, uh, you know, whether it's the the apps or the wearables or even some some of the wild stuff that we've been hearing about lately on the show. So someone was just profiling this technology about how our Wi-Fi uh, may eventually one day be able to predict if we fell down <laughs> in the same room. And 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 so it's it's getting to this point where this whole concept of aging in place um, and in care in the home is is really you know um, we're going to be seeing some interesting things that we haven't never seen before. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about sort of some of the whole age tech dynamic here as part of um, the, the integrated package that you're looking at. Yeah. So technology is fantastic. And, and you've mentioned a lot of things there, you know, keeping people in their home longer, um, you know, the ability to do early detection or, um, accurate diagnosis better. I, I think some of it will be in passive data collection, you know, your wearables, et cetera, but it's also in active data collection. You know, one of the things that I get really excited about technology because it is available today is we can do task shifting in a healthcare setting using right. a digital tool for cognitive assessment. So right now, you know, the best way to do cognitive assessment is eight or nine, eight or nine hours of a cognitive battery, right? That's not scalable. Um, and a lot of the pencil and paper tests that are used today in health systems are not incredibly sensitive to really pick up these mild cognitive impairment symptoms, which are the ones that are going to be the most likely to benefit from the new therapies. So there are these wonderful technologies that allow you to use, um, you know, phones and iPads and Apple mm -hmm. pens and things like that, that, that will allow you to task shift 
in a health system from a more expensive resource to a less expensive resource and also give you a higher quality result. So mm -hmm. this is sometimes called, you know, the quadruple aim, right? Where you can actually develop something that's more effective and more efficient. And when we see the aging population that's coming forward right now, using technology is of critical importance. The challenge is our regulatory and our Medicare systems, this is really new technology for them. So the regulatory process is very uncertain. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit like the wild, wild west uh, in terms of how do you really get to a, an approval and a quality validated tool, but then also how do you get it paid for? Medicare is not paying for these tools. And so how do you ensure that we find billing codes and practices in our health policy that encourage this task shifting because it's good for the system. It's good for the patient. Um, and so those are some of the things we've been chipping away at. And one of the reasons I do my best to speak as many of these conferences as I possibly can, because those policy changes are going to be necessary. Otherwise, once again, we've got innovation that's sitting around unused. And speaking of innovation, I mean, you've you've obviously been involved in in the cutting edge of drug development. You've talked about the diagnostics, early detection. We just talked about age tech. Um, what other areas, if you if you can mention, get you excited in, in this space, or the things that we you know uh, have not talked about yet, uh, or things that you see on the horizon that you're like, it'd be really nice if you know uh, we could dump a few dollars into that, or if we mature a certain way. Um, any any other segments that we should know about that we should keep our eyes on? Excited or irritated or both? Um, both, both. Why not? So you know, one of the things that drives me crazy right now is that we have an annual wellness visit that is a right, it is the right of everyone in this country age 65 and over to have an annual Medicare wellness visit annually. As part of that, there is a requirement to do a cognitive assessment. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, I'm really excited about that, right? Because we actually have legislative rights for people that are over 65. And a lot of times age is not the place where we've invested a lot of energy, but it only happens in the United States in 4% of Medicare beneficiaries. And so as a result, you end up with this huge stigma because the only time anyone gets a cognitive assessment is when something is really, really wrong. Mm. And so people worry about those cognitive assessments. Well, but think about it. If you go to the doctor, you get a cholesterol test, you do a fasting blood glucose, they take your blood pressure. The best way to measure your brain health is actually to measure it against yourself. So we should be doing cognitive assessments, brain health assessments as part of our annual wellness visits in Medicare. And honestly, we probably should be doing it as young as 50. And so if we were to do some of those things regularly, we would also reduce the stigma. Not only would we be able to identify signs and symptoms earlier and therefore make sure that patients have the greatest number of options in front of them, but you'd also be reducing the stigma because someone's not coming to you saying, I want to do a cognitive assessment because I think something's wrong. Someone says to you, hey, we want to make sure your brain is as healthy as your heart. And so what makes me excited right now is we're starting to see a shift in that. We're seeing technologies that are available to do that. We're seeing great data around these brain health action plans to where doctors can say, you know, I have something now to talk about with patients, if they come to me and they say they're worried because their mom had Alzheimer's disease or their dad did. And so now I can do um, a cognitive assessment for someone and say, you're just fine, but here's some brain healthy behaviors you should consider. So I would think, you know, we need our health policy side to catch up a little bit. There are reasons that this is only done in 4% of the United States today. Um, and a big part of it is we don't think about brain health as part of either the public health system or the clinical medicine system. So that's what I get pretty excited about. And um, I think baby boomers are gonna drive that. I don't think baby boomers are gonna sit around and say, we've worked this hard to age and celebrate longevity to not have the care they need to make sure they really uh, enjoy those golden years. So uh, I'd like to see more pressure put on fixing some of those, you know, just basic, building blocks mm -hmm. of a good health system around um, around our, our Medicare system to make sure that more people are thinking about their brain health before something goes wrong. Yeah, that's extremely important. 
Um, and, and on those notes, I just have to ask because um, I know recently um, uh, Melinda Gates, uh, you know, you know, there was an interview where she talked about sort of the, uh, as you mentioned, this unpaid caregiver uh, um, economy that's out there. And I think the number is somewhere up there, the $700 billion uh, that is just, you know, lost uh, the, the work that you, your sister, your mother uh, and alone taking care of your father. Um, anything interesting on the horizon that you see in terms of innovative solutions to this other major societal challenge in terms of the unpaid caregiver issue? Yeah, you mentioned the Global Coalition on Aging. You know, one of the things that happened when Prime Minister Cameron had the what was then the GA presidency back in 2013 was he kicked off a global action against dementia, which had a lot of the multilaterals get engaged. So the World Health Organization, the United Nations, OECD, G7, G20. And as such, um, several countries really were identified as super aging societies. Uh, Japan is one of the first ones. You know, you have a situation there where, uh, and this is going to happen to every single one of our countries, where this aging success we've had is starting to have a dramatic shift on things like social systems, social security, financial systems. In, J in Japan specifically, they have a shortage of caregivers. Yeah. Um, because they're trying to keep people in the home longer. They don't have as many people caring, working to care for an aging population. They've been very creative with robotics. Yeah. Uh, you know, Japan is a culture that's very comfortable with robotics. Um, and there's some really amazing things that are happening with technology um, in kind of robotics and care that allow for people to stay in their home longer. And so I'm excited about that. You mentioned the Wi-Fi about, you know, identifying if someone falls. Yeah. Falls are probably one of the greatest risks for people yeah. to be at home. And so these ideas of what we can do with the Internet of Things and smart home yeah. technology, we can actually do a lot of things where people are able to stay home. Um, you know, I'm working uh, with a company that actually has a very innovative toilet seat cover that yeah. can take your blood pressure when nice. you're using the bathroom. Well, what a wonderful thing to be able to do, right? You're not having to change the person's day-to-day -day activities. You're not yeah. adding something for them to do, but you're taking technology and embedding it in the way that they um, that they live their daily lives. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really what we want. We don't want to say, we're going to keep you at home and now we're going to give you a whole list of tasks that you're going to have to do that are new and technology that you're going to have to learn. We want to find a way to embed it in their day-to-day -day lives. So I get really excited about technology and what it can do. I get very scared because I'm not seeing our health system embrace those technologies. Um, there is a big effort in the UK right now to look at how do we actually um, embrace digital technologies in such a way that the NHS can pay for them, feel good about them, and they can really improve care. And so I'd like to see more of those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Let's think about embracing technology in the health system. Uh, I guess the other one I would add in the US that's really important is this shift from fee-for-service in Medicare okay. to value-based care. Uh, because in fee-for-service, you're just encouraging more activity. In value-based care, you're really looking at holistic care. How do I keep someone well longer? Mm -hmm. And cognition is part of that because someone with unrecognized cognitive impairment is not able to uh, follow the instructions, say, for a diabetes protocol. And right. so uh, I get really excited about both of those things. You know, technology and that technology's available ability to do things that make us more eff effective and efficient, but then shifting to value-based care, because I do think that that's one of the things that's going to allow health systems to embrace technology. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I love the... Uh... The sort of the, the ecosystem that you're you're thinking about, you know, when, when you when you look at uh, again all the as you mentioned earlier the, the thousand cuts, um, you know, looking at all the pieces here that uh, that have to come together, and it's it's very exciting. Um, what what other thing I just love to ask you about, Phil, is based on your experience, because um, it, it's 
you know, in addition to the age tech, you know, one of the topics that we we have gotten into quite a bit on our show is this sort of uh, growing um, longevity bioscience uh, community, sort of a, a segment of biotech, um, which has a goes by this sort of geroscience philosophy that says, you know, uh, it's great to target the heart disease and the cancers and the Alzheimer's disease, but there's also this bigger biologic problem occurring called aging uh, that ultimately leads to all these things. And we have the Aubrey de Grays and David Sinclairs and so forth out there developing uh, biologic products in that area. Any thoughts on this as a big pharma, uh, somebody that hung around big pharma for, for a few decades, um, you know, if somebody comes into the moonshot with sort of an aging focused uh, intervention, is, is that something of interest at all to wh where you're going? And what do you think about the space in general? I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, I'm very focused on aging in general because I right. think um, we have aging populations coming around the globe. That aging is a product of the success that we've had uh, yeah. by tackling, you know, non-communicable disease, yeah. and um, it's it's very exciting. So I think in general we have to think about aging populations. I tend to think about more of the systems that mm -hmm. support aging populations. Uh, where you're talking about there is that kind of longevity science. Um, yeah. What we do know is a lot of the diseases that we're dealing with right now are diseases of aging. Um, you know, even oncology, you know, even cancer is often a disease of aging, right? Uh, as cells get older, they're more likely to have these um, unusual permutations uh, yeah. from my explanation from a non-scientist. Uh, I think that the overlap of aging, longevity, science, and brain health is significant on the system side. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how how much the science overlaps. Yeah. Um, I just don't know it well enough to be able to, to comment on that. Um, I actually think Startup Health has talked about doing something that's more around longevity rather than very specific to brain health. Got it. I do think that it's, it's fairly nascent in its... Um, Science. I mean, you're still talking about things that are in non-clinical models right. a lot yeah. of times in vitro, not even in vivo yet. Um, but I think it's going to come along. And I do think that you'll see uh, pharma engage as it does. Maybe one of the challenges, and I don't know the answer to this, um, is how much the NIH funds those more non-disease target um, right disease and state and biology, uh, you know, understanding, because that's a lot of what NIH funds is some yeah. of that very, very early research. And, you know, academia tends to be organized by specialty or by disease. And academia drives a lot of that early stage research. So I think when you see, when you see academic institutions start really focusing on longevity, and you see the grants really coming out in longevity, I think you'll start to see uh, a movement in that space as well. I, I definitely re I really value and appreciate your insight on that one. So no, I uh, thank you for the for the input there. Um, so what what uh, what's coming up? Uh, what uh, should we be on the you know outlook for in terms of uh, what you're going to be up to the next several months? I know this is the inaugural year. Um, conferences, talks, other um, sort of milestones on the. Uh, I guess as the teams get put together and, and everything else happening, please um, take us into sure. 2024. Well, there's some there's some big data releases and big data milestones coming up. We're waiting to hear about an ad com that the FDA is going to run on Lily's Denanamab. So that should happen hopefully very soon. Um, there's also some data readouts, uh, phase two readout um, and phase three readouts from Alzion which is a small molecule for Alzheimer's disease that's looking at um, people with a specific gene around that's called ApoE4. Yep. So we're really interested to see what happens there. Um, another really neat technology uh, that's going to read out this later this year is Cognito, which is actually a device mm -hmm. that is worn around the head and eyes that uses uh, ultrasound and vibration and actually has shown mm -hmm. in phase two to have a positive impact on Alzheimer's disease. So there's some really cool readouts that are coming um, still this year. And then I'm sure there's a lot in the early phase space too. I just, I tend to follow those later stage ones. Sure. In terms of meetings and things that I'm really excited about, um, uh, obviously AAIC, which is the Alzheimer's Association and, um, 
international conference is happening in Philadelphia in July. That tends to have a lot of data readouts that comes with it. The Clinical Trials for Alzheimer's Disease, which is our second largest scientific conference, is happening in Madrid in the in the fourth quarter. There's usually a lot around that as well. Um, the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative will be launching its next implementation science program, uh, looking at accurate diagnosis and specifically the use of blood biomarkers um, yeah. in clinical practice, which is really important because while PET is a gold standard, um, PET imaging is pretty intensive. Um, and so having a blood biomarker that could triage patients uh, in a clinical setting to see really who does need to get a PET scan um, would be really exciting. So I think there's going to be just a, I mean, this is a space to watch. If you're yeah. interested in science, if, <laughs> as I like to say, the only people who have to worry about Alzheimer's disease are people who have brains and want to grow old. So mm -hmm. if you have a brain and you want to grow old, watch this space because the amount of innovation that's going to come over the next, even just two to three years is going to be astronomical. And it's really, really exciting for a field who has had a lot of success in the research side, but it hasn't kind of popped out of the research side until recently. And so it's going to be a really fun place to watch. Um, if you are a Scientific American subscriber, um, you will get a special edition looking at the new age of of Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. starting, I think it's going to be the May subscription. Uh, okay. If you're not, subscribe fast. Um, but <laughs> uh, but that'll be really exciting. So if you're interested in in tracking that along, that's a very nice um, a very nice piece that's going to talk about this new age of Alzheimer's. That's awesome. I'll, I'll definitely be able to look out for that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we we as a show uh, obviously love to to follow the space and all the innovation that's happening in it, and and obviously we'll continue to to follow you, uh, startup health, everything that you have going on as as you continue with these uh, milestones during the inaugural year, and um, just yeah, really wishing you the best, uh, you and the team as you, as you move for this extremely uh, important initiative for the major unmet medical need, I believe, of our time. Um, again, for everybody uh, that is going to be listening to this particular episode of our show um, across the various podcast networks or watching on our YouTube channel, again, you've been spending time with the amazing Dr. Phyllis Farrell, Chief Impact Officer, Startup Health's Alzheimer's Moonshot, um, as well as strategic advisor of the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative. Uh, Phyllis, I really want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule, for educating us about everything you're doing, what you've been up to. Um, obviously, thank you for doing it. And, and as we like to say on our show, you know, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for millions of people out there where what you're up to. Really a great story. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.